This is Nelson Olmstead. Sleep no more. Sink back in your chair and don't look into the shadows. In the shadows, there may be moving things. Tonight, it may be, you will sleep no more. Good evening. This is Ben Grauer introducing tonight's tale of terror told by Nelson Armstead on the National Broadcasting Company's presentation of Sleep No More. The story of terror can be as simple as a sheeted ghost rattling chains. It can be a complex and hidden world of horror, lurking in such unholy dimensions as only the dead and the moonstruck can glimpse. Or it can be those terrible, fathomless shadows which lie buried deep in the primitive mind of civilized man. And for this evening, well, Nelson Olmstead, tell us about this evening's story. Thank you, Ben. Our first story tonight is by a writer who is a master at what, uh, well, for want of a more descriptive phrase, we might call the clever story. Even if you have never read any of John Collier, which I don't believe for a moment, I'm sure you'll agree that he is a master of this sort of thing after you've heard thus... I refute Beelzey. There goes the tea bell, said Mrs. Carter. I hope Simon hears it. They looked out from the window of the drawing room. The long garden, agreeably neglected, ended in a waste plot. Here a little summer house was passing close by beauty on its way to complete decay. This was Simon's retreat. It was almost completely screened by the tangled branches of the apple tree and the pear tree, planted too close together as they always are in suburban gardens. They caught a glimpse of him now and then as he strutted up and down, mouthing and gesticulating, performing all the solemn mumbo-jumbo of small boys who spend long afternoons at the forgotten ends of long gardens. And Betty said, well, there he is, bless him. Yes, playing his game, said Mrs. Carter. He won't play with any of the other children anymore. And if I go down there, oh, the temper. And he comes in tired out. He uh, doesn't have his sleep in the afternoons. But you know what Big Simon's ideas are. Let him choose for himself, he says. That's what he chooses. And he comes in as white as a sheet. Oh, look, he's heard the bell said Betty. The expression was justified, though the bell had ceased ringing a full minute ago. Small Simon stopped in his parade. They watched him perform certain ritual sweeps and scratchings with his little stick and come lagging over the hot and flaggy grass toward the house. Mrs. Carter led the way down to the playroom or garden room, which was also the tea room for hot days. It had been the huge scullery of this tall Georgian house, and now the walls were cream-washed, and there were coarse blue net in the windows, canvas-covered armchairs in the stone floor, and a reproduction of Van Gogh's sunflowers over the mantelpiece. Small Simon came drifting in and accorded Betty a perfunctory greeting. His face was an almost perfect triangle, pointed at the chin. And he was paler than he should have been. And Betty said, oh, the little elf child. Simon looked at her and said, I am not. Well, at that moment, the door opened and Mr. Carter came in rubbing his hands. He was a dentist and washed them before and after everything he did. Mrs. Carter was surprised. Oh, home already? And Mr. Carter said, not unwelcome, I hope. Two people canceled their appointments and I decided to come home. I said, I hope I'm not unwelcome. Oh, silly. Of course not. Small Simon seems doubtful. Small Simon, 
Are you sorry to see me at tea with you? No, Daddy. No. What? No. Big Simon. That's right. Big Simon and Small Simon. That sounds more like friends, doesn't it? At one time, little boys had to call their father sir. If they forgot a good spanking on the bottom, Small Simon, on the bottom. The little boy turned crimson with shame or rage, and Betty, trying to help the situation, said, But uh, now, you see, you can call your father whatever you like. And what has Small Simon been doing this afternoon while Big Simon has been at work? Nothing. Then you've been bored. Now learn from experience, Small Simon. Tomorrow, do something amusing and you'll not be bored. I want him to learn from experience, Betty. This is my way, the new way. I have learned. The boy spoke like an old, tired man, as little boys so often do. It would hardly seem so if you sit in your behind all the afternoon doing nothing. Had my father caught me doing nothing, I should not have sat very comfortably. <laughs> Mrs. Carter said, Well, he played too hard as usual. He comes in all nervy and dazed. He ought to have his rest. He is six. He is a reasonable being. He must choose for himself. But uh, what game is this small Simon that is worth getting nervy and dazed over? There are very few games as good as all that. It's nothing. Oh, come. We're friends now, aren't we? You can tell me. I was a small Simon once, just like you, and played the same games you play. Of course, there were no aeroplanes in those days. With whom do you play this fine game? Come on. We must all answer civil questions or the world would never go round. With whom do you play? Mr. Beelzey. Mr. Beelzey? No, I don't believe I know a Mr. Beelzey. It's a, a game that he makes up, Simon. I... I don't make it up. Well, now, this is telling stories, said his mother, and rude as well, so we'd better talk of something different. Well, no wonder he's rude, said Mr. Carter. If you say he tells lies and then insist on changing the subject, he tells you his fantasy. You implant a guilt feeling. What can you expect? A defense mechanism. Then you get a real lie. Small Simon is in the fantasy stage. Are you not Small Simon? You just make things up. No, I don't, said the boy. You do. And because you do, it's not too late to reason with you. There's no harm in a fantasy, old chap. There's no harm in a bit of make-believe. Only you have to know the difference between daydreams and real things, or your brain will never grow. It will never be the brain of Big Simon. So come on. Let us hear about this Mr. Beelzey of yours. Come on. What's he like? He isn't like anything. Like nothing on earth? Oh, that's a terrible fellow. I'm not frightened of him. Not a bit. Well, I should hope not. If you were, you'd be frightening yourself. I'm always telling people, older people than you are, that they're just frightening themselves. Is he a funny man? Is he a giant? Sometimes he is. Sometimes one thing, sometimes another. Sounds pretty vague. Why can't you tell us just what he's like? I love him. And he loves me. Love is a big word. That might be better kept for real things like Big Simon and Small Simon. He is real. He's not a fool. He's real. Listen. When you go down to the garden, there's nothing there, is there? No. And then you think of him inside your head and he comes. No, I have to do something with my stick. But that doesn't matter. Yes, it does. Small Simon, you're being obstinate. I'm trying to explain something to you. Now, I've been longer in the world than you have, so naturally I'm older and wiser. Now, I'm explaining that Mr. Beelzey is a fantasy of yours. Do you hear? Do you understand? Yes, Daddy. He's a game. He is, uh, well, let's pretend. The little boy looked down at his plate, smiling resignedly. I hope you're listening to me. All you have to do is say, I have been playing a game of let's pretend with someone I make up called Mr. Beelzey. Then no one will say you tell lies and 
you will know the difference between dreams and reality. Mr. Beelzy is a daydream. The little boy still stared at his plate. He is sometimes there and sometimes not there. Sometimes he's like one thing, sometimes another. You can't really see him, not as you see me. I am real. You can't touch him. You can touch me. I can touch you. Now, you know the difference between pretend and a real thing. You and I are one thing, he is another. Now, which is the pretend? Come on, answer me. Which is the pretend? Big Simon and small Simon. Well, my boy, I have said you must be allowed to learn from experience when I go upstairs, right up to your room. You shall learn whether it is better to reason or be perverse and obstinate. Now, now go on up. I shall follow you. Mrs. Carter said, Well, you, uh, you aren't going to beat the child, are you, dear? No, said the little boy. M Mr. Beelzy won't let him. Go on up with you. Small Simon stopped at the door. He said... He wouldn't let anybody hurt me. He said he'd come like a lion with wings on and eat them up. You learn how real he is. If you can't learn it at one end, you shall learn it at the other. Be ready for a good solid whipping. But I shall finish my cup of tea first, he said to the two women. Neither of the women spoke. Mr. Carter finished his tea and unhurriedly left the room, washing his hands with his invisible soap and water. Mrs. Carter said nothing. Betty could think of nothing to say. She wanted to be talking. She was afraid of what they might hear. <laughs> Suddenly it came. It seemed to tear the air apart. Betty jumped out of her chair and said, What was that? He's hurt, small Simon. I'm going up there. Yes, yes, let's go up, said Mrs. Carter. Let's go up. That wasn't small Simon. It was on the second floor landing that they found the shoe with Mr. Carter's foot still in it, like that last morsel of a mouse which sometimes falls from the jaws of a hasty cat. A clever story indeed, Nelson. And a slightly chilling one, too. Yes, Ben. That's another characteristic of Collier's work. And now for our second story. It's by another favorite author of mine, Nelson S. Bond. This is a story about a place where better books than have ever been published are probably being read. If that sounds a bit confusing, it was meant to. The story is called The Bookshop. <laughs> In the dead sultriness of the Manhattan midsummer, there was no incentive to write. Marston's apartment was like the inside of a kiln. Two hours ago, he had stripped off his damp shirt and sat down before his typewriter. Now, for all his labors, he had nothing to show but a dozen crumpled balls of bond paper flung haphazardly in and at the waste paper basket. He read again the three chapters he had completed. It was good work, some of the best he'd ever done, smoothly written. The underling. A psychological story of defeat and of ones who let themselves be defeated. The fault, dear Brutus, is not with our stars. Hmm. A good theme. And so far, a good job. But this heat, this overwhelming, enervating heat. He was, Marston realized with a sudden petulant anger, ill, actually and physically ill. He gave up. With a final despairing glance at the white sheet shining in the typewriter, he rose. He was shocked to find his exhaustion so deep that as he stood, he was dizzy and spots danced before his eyes. But it was brief and it soon passed. There could only be suffocation and discomfort as long as he remained here. Out of doors, it would be hot too, but there might be a ghost of a breeze stirring in the shaded streets down by the river. Marston put on his shirt and coat and went out.
he hadn't remembered the little bookshop was along this way. Had indeed quite forgotten the little shop until suddenly there it was just a few paces before him. Then he recalled the several occasions on which before he had seen it and planned to drop in for a browse. Each time circumstances had prevented his doing so. But now... Well, the bookshop was far from prepossessing in appearance, ancient and musty. How long it had been a fixture in this neighborhood, Marston had no way of knowing. It did, apparently, but a slight business. For of the many who passed it, no one but himself so much as turned a head to peer into its dusty window. He had seen it first a year ago or so, that afternoon when, with poor Thatcher, he had been riding by here on a bus. Thatcher was a minor poet. Not a very good one, but an ardent one. He'd been regaling Marston with an enthusiastic preview of his latest masterpiece, soon to be released. He had said, Oh, very soon, Marston. Just a few more stanzas and it goes to the publisher. Oh, it's such good work, Marston. This isn't like anything I've done before. It's poetry this time, real poetry. Oh, I'm calling it Songs of a New Century. Oh, it'll make me, Marston. This book will give me a reputation. You see if I'm not right. Oh, 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 I say he stopped suddenly, and Marston, glancing up swiftly, remembered that Thatcher's health was reportedly on the thin edge. The man didn't look at all well. His cheeks were too pale, his eyes too dark and sunken. And Thatcher said, well, I, I, I just remembered a little errand. A, a chap I have to see in that old bookshop. A chap's an old friend of mine. Well, I, I'll, I'll see you later, Marston. Now, now watch for the songs. He had, thought Marston regretfully, been mistaken. On both counts. They never met again. Nor did the new book ever appear. The next day, Marston read his name in the obituary column. All of a year ago, that had been. Since then, Marston had thought often of the little bookshop... It held a sort of a macabre fascination for him, an association of ideas Marston could not explain even to himself. Last winter, when he lay ill of the flu, it had become almost an obsession with him. He experienced an insensate desire to climb from his sickbed and visit it, a curious urge, but one so powerful that when finally he recovered, he did make a special trip to the little shop. But he had chosen a poor time. It was closed. The door was latched and bolted and the shades drawn tight. Now, however, it was not closed. The shade was up, the door an inch or so invitingly ajar. And though the shop was small, there would be coolness in its musty depths. The sun poured on Marston's head and pressed on his shoulders with a ponderable weight. His head ached and a dull nausea was upon him. He opened the door and went in. The transition from glaring sunlight to shaded dark was abrupt. At first he could see nothing. Marston, stumbling forward, bumped against the table. Out of the shadows before him came a quiet, sympathetic voice. Oh, did you hurt yourself, my friend? Uh, uh, no, but it's dark in here. Dark? Dark. Oh, yes, yes, I, uh, it is, I suppose. Uh, but peaceful. Marston could see more plainly now. He stood in the center of a small, low-ceilinged room, walled on either side with shelves of books. Beyond the table was a tiny desk, and at the desk a quiet figure sat imperturbably scratching with an old goose quill in a ledger open before him. In the bad light, Marston could not clearly see the proprietor's face, but he saw snow-white hair shining like a halo in the gloom and bent shoulders. There was, he felt, something vaguely familiar about the old man's features, something tantalizingly near the fringes of his memory. It slipped away even as he tried to grasp it, and the proprietor looked up. Who... Oh, is there anything in particular, my friend? I, I'm just looking. Well, there is no need for haste. Marston turned to the shelves. It didn't occur to him at once that there was anything unusual about the books in which he looked. That realization came upon him gradually. Hence, it came as a slow, growing wonder, and not with any deep, sharp sense of shock. He glanced among the row of books, poetry, plays, novels, essays, texts, stood side by side in scrambled heterogeneity. Titles heretofore unknown to Marston, new names and old, old thoughts and new. Then he saw a thin volume brown with age, the title, Agamemnon, and the author, William Shakespeare. Well, how could this be? What did it mean? Agamemnon and by Shakespeare? He knew of no such title. This was one of two things, either the greatest hoax ever perpetrated, or he had stumbled across an amazing discovery. He reached, 
Then his hand in reaching paused, for now he saw other titles, books equally unknown and equally amazing. King Arthur of Britain by John Milton, The Leprechaun by Don Byrne, Robert Louis Stevenson's Gannon Mills, and Darkling Moors by Jane Austen, The Gargoyle's Eye by Edgar Allan Poe. He had heard no footsteps, but he was aware that at his side now stood the proprietor of the little shop. There was quiet pleasure in the old man's voice. You uh, admire my books, young friend? I, well, I, I don't understand. You are Robert Marston, aren't you? Mm -hmm. Fantasy is in your line. You should appreciate these others. Marston's gaze helplessly followed the proprietor's gesture. He looked upon names as well known to him as his own, but at titles never before dreamed of. The Troglodytes by Jules Verne. Charles Fort's What Unseen Presence and Lovecraft's bulky Complete History of Demonology. And under these, a smaller volume, a thin, bright volume with untarnished book jacket. Its title, Songs of a New Century. Its author, David Thatcher. It was then, suddenly, that Marston understood. A great, dull prescience filled him, and to his host he said in a voice that was strangely tired, I uh, suppose my book, it's here then. Who, the underlings? Yes, my son, it's here too. There was but one copy, fresh and shining new, as if it had at this very moment come from the publisher's office. Uh, uh, may I? Well, it's your book. And Marston took it down. Oh, some few changes had been made, he found, in the opening chapters, but they were minor editings. Swiftly, though, he read, he knew that he had not been wrong in claiming this as his finest work. There was no mediocrity in this book, no faltering, no stumbling confusion of ideas. Each sentence was perfect, no word or thought or phrase that didn't shine with lustrous purity. This was the book Marston had always meant to write. It was the book he had always known lay somewhere deep within him. Here was the triumphant accomplishment of his writing powers. And Marston, who knew books, knew that this book was great and that in it, at the end, his skill had attained its full fruition. At the end! He closed the book, and its closing was a small and startling sound in the silence, and he stared at his host, realizing now why he looked familiar. A coldness was upon him and a sudden fear, and he said loudly, well, well, no, not now, old man, not before it's finished. Well, surely you can see it cannot be finished over there, Marston. Nothing is ever perfect on that side. Only in this bookshop are stories and songs high and sweet and true as their authors dreamed them. There, the underlings would be just another book, a cloth-bound, crippled symbol of a dream that died at birth. Thoughts as lofty as the stars, faltering on words too weak to bear them. Only in the library of the left undone may a story reach the heights intended by its creator. Here, beside an epic Homer ever meant to write, and a play that Marlowe planned but did not put into words, Galsworthy's last and greatest romance, ten thousand tales unwritten by a thousand dreamers, here... The underlings can take its rightful place in the imperishable library of might have been. It is the final price for perfection, and a small one. His voice sighed into silence like the last faint whisper of the ebbing tide. And it seemed to Marston that a new sound reached his ears. It was as though voices spoke to him from some not distant place, voices greeting him in good fellowship, bidding him come in and join their camaraderie. He heard, or thought he did, the laughing voice of Thatcher. Well, now, what's the fuss, old boy? My soul, but you're making an issue of a simple matter. And now the old man held out his hand to Marston. Are you ready now, my friend? But there was the book in his hand, and suddenly there swept into Marston's brain a daring thought. It wasn't yet too late, nor would it be, until that ancient hand met his. Could he but reach the street outside, and with this book, the underlings might yet be given to the world in all its dreamed perfection. He rushed for the door. The worn knob slipped beneath his palm. Behind him, the soft voices rose in a wailing crescendo of dismay. A sigh whispered in his ear, There is no escape, my son. You but delay. Then the door was open. 
with that precious volume clenched in his hands, he cried aloud his triumph, staggered into the street, running, running. He didn't hear the voices raised in swift warning, nor the startled rasp of the horn, nor the screaming grind of the brakes. He heard only the deafening tumult of the world flaming into oblivion. Then, the silence again, and the soft voices calling him to join them, and the chiding voice of the ancient one. You but delay, my son. Are you ready now? And a cool hand meeting his own. I, I couldn't help hitting him, said the truck man. Okay, said the big man in blue. Okay, it wasn't your fault. Uh, where did he come from, anyhow? A witness pointed with a shaking finger. Why, over there, officer, that vacant lot across the street. Yeah, I, I saw him wandering around in there, mumbling to himself. Why, I think he must have had a sunstroke the way he acted. That property's been vacant for years. Well, I'll take your name. Anybody recognize him? Oh, let's see that book he was carrying. Maybe it's got his name in it. Someone handed the book to him. He leafed through the volume briefly, tilted back his cap, and scratched his forehead. Hey, this is the queerest looking book I ever saw. Look, three chapters printed, and the rest of it nothing but blank pages. can turn up the lights now. You can look around you. Nobody's there, really. Everything is all right, isn't it? You have just heard two stories told by Nelson Olmsted. The first was Thus I Refute Beelzey by John Collier. The second, The Bookshop by Nelson S. Bond. And what do you have on the board for next week, Nelson? Ben, one of my great favorites among great suspense stories. The Escape of Mr. Trim by Irvin S. Cobb. I hope you can be with us. You have been listening to Sleep No More an NBC Radio Network production directed by Daniel Sutter. Mr. Armstead's albums are recorded exclusively for Vanguard Records. Until next week, when Nelson Armstead will again be here in person, this is Ben Grower saying good night.